Once known as the right arm of the free world, and still a common sight in brushfire wars, the FAL is one of the most widely used rifles of the 20th century. The fact that it's so rare in airsoft may be because manufacturers have been busy with so many other products more widely demanded by players, but here we are at last. Today, we're reviewing VFC's gas blowback version of everyone's favorite boat war. For some historical context, the FAL's development began in 1946 under the direction of Dudeney Sev, a former assistant to John Browning and accomplished designer in his own right. This is one of the first post-World War II intermediate caliber rifles, initially chambered in the 8mm Kurtz cartridge previously used by the STG-44. While both the UK and US expressed interest, their preferences for the 280 British and 30 light rifle calibers respectively led FN to abandon the 8mm Kurtz and develop new prototypes. Despite promising trials, the UK decided to adopt the EM2 bullpup and 280 British, while the US, in a characteristic moment of not invented here, instead chose the T44 prototype, a modified M1 Garand, which would eventually become the M14. However, the EM2 program fell through entirely, leaving the UK without a new service rifle, while US pressure led to NATO standardizing on the 30 light rifle, today known as 7.62x51 NATO. FN's prototype in this caliber had already done well in US trials and was well received by other NATO members, and in 1953 formal production of the Fusil Automatique Légère, or Light Automatic Rifle, began. The FAL would ultimately be adopted by over 90 countries, with several setting up domestic production under license. It prominently saw combat in the Falklands, Northern Ireland, the Six Day War, and virtually every post-1950 conflict on the African continent. While it started to be phased out by the 1980s in favor of intermediate caliber rifles, it is an iconic rifle of the Cold War and, even today, still sees frequent use in the hands of irregulars. Because of widespread manufacture under license, there's some nuance to FAL variants. To start with, the FAL family is divided into metric pattern and inch pattern. The metric guns are the original FN design and their derivatives, while the inch pattern guns are the ones manufactured by British Commonwealth countries and are dimensionally different in many key areas. Within the metric family, early variants, including those purchased by Austria and Germany, used wood stocks and grips and either steel or wood handguards, while the later variants switched to polymer furniture and incorporated dimensional and machining changes to the receivers. So VFC appears to have replicated a Belgian-made FAL 50.0, basically the original FAL design. The VFC has a Type 1 receiver, which was mostly manufactured before 1962, with plastic furniture and a muzzle brake which weren't present on the original FAL design. Overall, this can be characterized as a 1960s era Belgian FAL or a direct copy such as the South African R1, or perhaps an arsenal rework of an early gun. Let's go through the externals and I'll explain further. First off, for point of comparison, this is a semi-auto FAL built on an Imbel parts kit. The many small differences between this rifle and the VFC aren't because VFC got it wrong, but because there is such variety in details among the different manufacturers of FAL. In terms of overall finish, the VFC is a nice parkerizing on all the steel parts, it's a good replica of a military finish, and the few alloy parts are a close enough color not to stand out. Note that as in our Uzi review, we've rubbed oil into all the metal parts, as parkerized guns would historically be maintained this way in military service. The plastic furniture, on the other hand, is a bit disappointing as it looks and feels cheap, but besides that, nothing about the gun looks particularly toy-like or has a finish that might give it away as an airsoft gun. On to specifics. So at the very front of the VFC is the steel muzzle device, which replicates the slip-over style of the Belgian muzzle brake. Behind it is the steel front half of the barrel with a steel sling swivel. Just in front of the handguards, you can see that the color changes. That's because most of the barrel is actually zinc alloy, commonly known as pot metal, and the steel section is a threaded extension. We'll be coming back to the implications of this design later, but note that by default, VFC positions the sling swivel at the join to cover up this discrepancy, but that's actually the mounting point for a bipod, so we've moved the sling swivel to its correct position. Next we have the gas block, which is also alloy, but the gas plug in front of it is steel, as is the front sight and the mock gas regulator. The front sight is a simple post, which adjusts for elevation by screwing it in or out, which is easy with the multi-tool that VFC includes with the gun. Enclosing the rest of the barrel and gas tube are the handguards, which are plastic with steel end caps. The plastic has a bit of subtle texture that gives it some depth, but these are flimsy and creaky to a degree that even surplus handguards aren't. For comparison, on the real FAL, these plastic handguards are solid and take real gorilla strength to deform to any degree. Moving back, the handguard retainer cap and gas tube cover are both steel, but then the receiver itself is alloy. 
This is obviously a pretty significant part to not make out of steel. Again, we'll talk more about that later. For now, just note that on the right side of the receiver, the slope profile at the front and lack of reinforcement at the rear identify this as a Type 1 early receiver. On a real one, this slanted profile at the front indicates that this is a Type 3 or late production, and a receiver with the Type 1 sloping profile but this rear reinforcement would be a Type 2. Anyways, while the receiver is alloy, the carry handle is steel, the dust cover is steel, the bolt is steel, the takedown pins are steel, and the trigger housing is zirconium. Now that's steel too. On the other side, the charging handle guide is alloy, but the core of the handle itself is steel, and the locking piece that secures it to the receiver is also steel. All the other controls are steel, including the bolt release, magazine release, trigger, and selector switch, as is the trigger guard. Now is a good time to point out that on the underside of the front of the receiver is a small screw, and this is actually the hop adjustment, which we'll come back to later. For markings, inside the magazine well we have a serial number, which is unique to each gun. Supposedly the initial run was 1000 guns, so this is number 813. The selector markings are French, S for sûr, or safe, R for répétition, or semi-auto, and A for automatique, or you guessed it, full auto. Incidentally, FALs manufactured in or for English-speaking countries would typically keep the same markings, as they can be interpreted as safe, repeating, and automatic, so this is also accurate to a South African license-built copy, but British and Australian guns would have some other differences, which we'll mention later. That's actually it for markings, so next is the rear takedown lever. Again, this is steel, but note that this vertical style is accurate to an early FAL, while later ones would have a horizontal takedown lever instead. Then the rear sight assembly is entirely steel. This is a push-button slider adjustment to adjust for range, marked from 200 to 600 meters, and then the screws on either side set windage. Loosen on the side to adjust towards, and then tighten on the opposite side. Very simple system. The aperture is intended for long-range shooting and is a bit small, so drilling it out slightly may be beneficial for airsoft use, particularly in low light or under tree cover. Note also that the screws have a tendency to back out in use, allowing the sight to shift laterally, so a bit of thread locker on both screws will help. The stock and grip are both more of the same plastic, although thankfully there's no wobble here. The stock also has a steel sling swivel insert, and what looks like, and should be, a rubber butt pad, but is actually solid plastic. And then the magazine has a plastic top on an alloy body with a steel floor plate. Unlike the alloy parts on the gun, where an effort was made to make them look like parkerized steel, the magazine body is just flat black. That's actually accurate to real FAL mags, so fair enough. Overall, the look and feel of the gun is pretty close to the real thing. In large part, that's because of the amount of steel that VFC has used in its construction, with a good-looking parkerizing job on the steel parts, but also the surface finish of the alloy parts, which keeps them from standing out among the steel. I can nitpick that it's noticeably lighter than the real thing at 8 pounds loaded, and that the center of gravity is farther back, but frankly, those can be fixed with weights inside the handguards if I really wanted. And a steel receiver would be nice, but the use of alloy there isn't a functional issue as it's a fairly thick part and the steel trigger housing provides support. However, the use of alloy is a functional issue for the barrel, because again, the steel outer section is only secured to the alloy inner section by standard 14mm negative threads. That means that if anything strikes the muzzle, all that stress is applied to pop metal threading. This is a big miss for VFC because it undermines the quality of the rest of the gun. For all the steel used elsewhere, it'll still need to be treated gently, because if the barrel breaks in half, all the nice steel parts are just paperweights. And lastly, the furniture is mediocre, and I'm more annoyed than I reasonably should be that the butt pad is plastic instead of rubber, but bad furniture is really par for the course with most airsoft guns. We'll talk about compatibility with real furniture later, but for now, suffice to say, it can be replaced. Anyways, let's field strip the gun and then have a look at the internals. First, make sure the hammer is cocked, then push the takedown lever to break open the action. Grab the tail of the bolt and pull it out, and this plastic short stroke buffer will come with it. Then pull the dust cover out. That's it for basic field stripping, but let's continue with full disassembly. On the receiver group, I'll start by unscrewing the muzzle device to show that there are standard 14mm negative threads underneath. Next, I can unscrew the barrel itself to reveal a shorter inner barrel. At this point, we want to note that the issue of barrel fragility can be potentially avoided by simply threading a muzzle device onto these threads and running the gun as a shortened carbine. However, the original muzzle device will not work, as the threads start too far up for it to fit. Also note that out of the box, there's an o-ring that keeps the inner barrel aligned, 
we found that tightening down the barrel extension tends to cause this o-ring to twist the inner barrel slightly, which causes hop problems, so we would recommend leaving this o-ring out and simply shimming the barrel with tape. Next, the handguards come off by unscrewing a single screw, then pulling them off. On the gas block, pushing in the button on the mock gas plug unlocks it, and then turning it 90 degrees allows it to come out the front. This reveals the mock gas piston and spring, which are an interesting, albeit pretty unnecessary touch. Unscrewing the gas tube cover allows it to slide forward, and at this point, nothing is holding the carry handle in. The manual does have instructions on removing the carry handle, but it makes no mention of the fact that it cannot be removed unless the gas piston is removed first, and provides no instructions on doing so. By the way, on real FALs, the carry handle is normally tight in its track so that it doesn't flop around, and this is accomplished by slightly bending the loop on the carry handle so that it tensions like a spring. This can be done on the VFC with just a pair of pliers. I want to make a quick note here, hidden underneath the front sight is a grub screw that secures the gas block to the barrel. If the gas block comes loose or becomes misaligned to the receiver during reassembly, this screw can be loosened to adjust its alignment, then tightened again to secure it. Okay, so at this point, we're actually ready to remove the barrel. First, this grub screw hidden by the charging handle must be loosened, and then the barrel can be unscrewed from the receiver. Once the barrel comes off, the inner barrel assembly can be pulled out. We have a black aluminum inner barrel, 350mm long, with typical VSR spec cuts and a VSR spec bucking, held in this clamshell alignment unit. Fairly standard, although an aluminum barrel is not ideal. Behind the barrel, though, is the hop adjustment. Taking this out first requires loosening the grub screw at the front, tapping the receiver on a hard surface to dislodge a pin holding in the adjustment screw, and then removing the hop adjustment screw entirely. Once that's out, the hop adjustment... cradle? Sure, let's go with that. The cradle comes out, followed by the feed ramp. So the way the hop-up works is fairly simple. Tightening the screw pulls down on this cradle, which presses on the bucking in essentially a reverse TDC setup. That means there's no choice of nub, and you may notice this has a narrow but curved contact surface, which limits which buckings are suitable. More on that later. Also, while a basic flathead screwdriver will work fine to adjust hop-up, BFC's included multi-tool can do it as well. Moving on to the bulk carrier, this is a hefty chunk of steel at 289 grams. That's about as heavy as a GHK or VFC AR carrier plus buffer combined, so this is a significant amount of reciprocating mass. The nozzle has a faux extractor molded in, just a fun touch for the sake of realism. The carrier group rides in simple rails on the receiver, similar to an AK, and the tail is related to the recoil mechanism, which we'll get to. For now, let's take apart the nozzle. So first things first, taking out two securing pins allows the nozzle stop to fall out. On the back of the carrier, unscrewing a single screw frees the nozzle, and then it comes right out the front. The nozzle is interesting because it appears to be all one piece. Punching out the rear pin frees the return spring assembly, and punching out the front pin frees the rocket valve and spring. And that's the entire nozzle. Body with O-rings, two pins, return spring, rocket valve, and rocket valve spring. The rocket valve is a standard VFC design. We've modified this one by adding a grub screw to allow us to adjust the muzzle velocity, but a CL project adjustable valve is all of $10. The gun produces about 1.8 joules out of the box with 0.32 gram BBs, so some form of adjustment is likely needed. I now reassemble the nozzle by reversing prior steps, taking care to keep the rocket valve properly aligned until I can get the cross pin in, and it all goes back together pretty easily. Next, to remove the receiver from the trigger housing, this takedown pin needs to be unscrewed. A flathead screwdriver will work fine, but again, VFC's multi-tool can function as a wrench. This side unscrews and pulls out, and then the other side can be pushed through. The receiver incorporates a couple of critical functional elements outside of the actual fire control group. 
First, this lever is the auto-sear or out-of-battery safety, and it prevents the hammer from falling until the bolt is fully forward. Next, the bolt catch is a vertically sliding tab actuated by the magazine. And lastly, the valve knocker is a long, spring-loaded tab running through this thick guide. All three of these parts are steel, overbuilt, and well-supported in their range of travel. There's no valve knocker lock, so the release of gas is controlled entirely by the hammer. The fire control group is virtually identical to that of the real FAL. On safe, the trigger cannot be pulled. On semi, it releases the hammer once, but then a disconnector retains it until the trigger is released. And on full auto, once the trigger releases the hammer, the auto sear in the receiver controls when it falls. While we're here, there's a minor issue we should address. If the trigger is pulled just enough to fire, then partially released before the gun can cycle, the hammer can sometimes skip over the trigger sear and immediately fire again. That sounds difficult to do, but we found it happens maybe once a mag during semi-auto spam. To fix it, we need to detail strip the fire control group. First, pull the hammer spring plunger back and then out. Swivel the selector upright, then wiggle it out of the trigger housing. Rotate up the pin lock and pull it free of the housing. Push out the hammer pin and remove it. And then do the same for the trigger. And pull out the sear, plunger, and sear spring. So there are two issues with the sear. First, it was a bit tight in the trigger, causing it to feel a little sluggish and potentially not reset quickly enough. This would probably break in over time, but we filed the sides to give it a bit of clearance. More importantly, we also noticed that the hammer simply drops when released, rather than pulling slightly downwards before releasing like a real FAL hammer should. So, we filed a slightly steeper angle into the sear to ensure more positive lockup. When I pull the trigger now, you can see how the hammer dips slightly before it releases, and this more stable lockup where the hammer tension is actively pulling the sear into engagement solves the doubling issue. Now to be clear, there weren't any signs of wear on the sear, and the rifle did this since day one. It just seems like VFC didn't quite replicate this tiny nuance of the FAL's fire control system, and thus accidentally replicated an issue that real FALs with high round counts can run into. Anyways, the doubling issue is now gone, although since this is literally the last thing we're recording, you may still notice it later in the review. I'll finish putting this back together and then we'll move on. Piece of cake. Behind the fire control group is a plate which retains the recoil spring assembly. Note that on the real thing, this plate is welded on, but on the VFC, it's secured with two screws, one in front and one concealed by the stock. The recoil spring is entirely captive in the stock, and if I reassemble the gun but leave off the dust cover, I can demonstrate how this works. The long tail hanging off the back of the bolt carrier engages with this plunger, and as the bolt is pulled back, it depresses the plunger into the stock. As a fun bit of trivia, this is nearly identical to the recoil spring arrangement on a Browning Auto 5, which, since it was manufactured by FN, was very familiar to Sev and the other designers. Anyways, there's also this plastic puffer to talk about. This reduces the travel of the carrier, increasing the cyclic rate and changing the feel of recoil with no impact to efficiency. With the buffer removed, we have not observed any significant wear to either the carrier or this plate on the trigger housing. Basically, it's a flat surface on the bolt hitting a flat surface on the trigger housing, exactly as on the real rifle, and again, both parts here are steel. We'll be continuing to monitor, but for now, we believe this gun can be safely used without the buffer, and we'll talk about the difference that makes when we get to performance. So overall, the internals on this gun are very well made. In addition to moving parts being almost entirely steel, the design is relatively simple and heavily patterned off the real FAL. 
Additionally, most screws in the gun were thread-locked from the factory, so first-time disassembly was a bit tough on some parts, but this does help ensure the gun will not experience rapid unplanned disassembly during use, aside from the few screws that are inexplicably not thread-locked. And lastly, the bolt carrier and receiver were caked in thick silicone grease, so VFC definitely did not skimp on lubrication. Considering how VFC GBBs used to be, full of pot metal and fragile, overly complex designs, this is all a massive improvement. Now let's have a look at the magazine. Before disassembling, I want to point out that the gas router is actually capable of moving up and down in its track bit. In theory, this allows the router to perfectly mate with the nozzle and seal better, while still flaring outwards under pressure to seal in the magazine, and since the router can be pushed downwards easily, there's no risk of the nozzle hanging up. Interesting design, and while we're not sure whether it makes a practical difference to efficiency, it does mean the nozzle never hangs up on the router. Removing these two screws releases the top plate, and then the router and stop on empty parts can be removed. Additionally, the release valve can be removed regardless of whether or not the top cover is still in place. Note that this lever on the side is a dry fire switch, so the gun can be fired without locking open. As mentioned before, the feed lips are molded directly into the top plate, so they receive structural support from this entire surface. It's good plastic too. Its hard surface and non-reactivity with acetone suggest it's nylon rather than the more common ABS used by many other companies. That hardness does also mean that getting BBs into and out of the feed lips is rather difficult, but we haven't yet run into any misfeeds, so only time will tell if this is actually a problem as it is on GHKs. VFC's prescribed method of loading is to use a speed loader adapter, which comes with the gun, and push the BBs in directly from above. On the bottom of the magazine, pulling off the floor plate reveals an end cap with five screws. If I take these screws out, again very tight and thread locked from the factory, I can pull off the cap and inspect the gas reservoir. This is an enormous internal volume, partially separated by a center rib likely for structural reinforcement. On the end cap, I can remove the seal, which is a custom gasket in typical VFC fashion. On the one hand, this means replacements will have to come directly from VFC, but on the other hand, this is a much more sophisticated solution for sealing a pressure-bearing vessel than the O-rings that are typically used in Airsoft, and it's entirely possible that it just won't ever need to be replaced. All seven of the magazines we got sealed perfectly out of the box, and in the course of testing we haven't experienced any leaks. This magazine holds 28 BBs in total, and the gun comes with a speed loader adapter for loading it. The real thing has a capacity of 20, so the extra capacity is nice given the cost of gas mags, not to mention the enormous size of this mag compared to a 5.56 magazine. I have to say I really like these magazines. There's a minimum of seals that need to be maintained, the things that might need maintenance are easy to access, the feed lips are tough without being brittle so these mags can survive being dropped, it's easy to load, and the internal reservoir design does seem to prevent overfilling. This is light years ahead of, say, old Western Arms spec magazines where you have to take out 37 screws and 14 O-rings just to get at the output valve, and then it leaks if you sneeze too loudly. Well, now that we've gone through the entire gun, let's demonstrate how it actually operates. Magazines insert in a rock and lock style, but it's much more like a G3 than an AK. Just insert a magazine at an angle until it stops, then rock it back until it clicks. The magazine release is a vertical paddle behind the magazine with serrations for texture. The intended method of reloading is to push the release with the offhand thumb, but it can be also actuated with the dominant index finger. Note that the magazine release is offset to the right, so reaching it with the index finger will be more difficult for a left-handed shooter. The left side charging handle is non-reciprocating and locks into place at the front of its track. Not much to say here, just rack it to cycle the action and release. When the bolt is locked open, it can be released by either pressing the bolt release downwards, or as long as there isn't an empty magazine inserted, just rack the charging handle. The selector is a swiveling type, and while it was very stiff initially, it has broken in with use. It clicks at each detent position, so isn't too hard to switch, but it is possible to overrun the semi-auto position, and then the gun will not shoot. The shape of the pistol grip also prevents me from disengaging the safety without breaking my grip, so as with many rifles of this era, it's best to leave it on fire in an engagement and then practice proper trigger discipline to avoid a negligent discharge. Speaking of the trigger, it's unsurprising, given how closely VFC copied the real thing, that the feel of this trigger is very similar to its real counterpart. There's a short take up to the wall, then a slightly sloppy break across it. It resets as soon as the trigger is released to the position of the wall. This pole is only around 4 pounds in total, so lighter than the real FAL, but the general feel is the same and it's easy to rapid fire. 
All right, now let's actually shoot it. But first things first, I'm putting on hearing protection and not just to LARP on Instagram. Because the very first thing I noticed when I first shot this gun was how my right ear was set ringing by one shot on semi-auto. With a decibel meter, we've determined that the shooter's right ear of the gun is putting out over 100 decibels, which exceeds the threshold for hearing damage from sustained exposure. Now we know video doesn't really capture the sound an airsoft makes all that well, but let's try a comparison. First, a TM spec Glock. Next, a ViperTech. And now back to the FAL. On top of the sound, the recoil is excellent once the short stroke buffer has been removed. Frankly, we're not sure why this was included to begin with because it truly is not necessary on this gun. Without it, the cycling is still snappy, but the extra carrier travel produces a much more noticeable sense of moving weight. On full auto, the lack of buffer gives a real jackhammer feel and cadence to the recoil, and a cyclic rate more appropriate to a battle rifle. Overall, this rifle just feels great to shoot. The homemade adjustment solution gives it arbitrary FPS, but let's test for consistency. Pretty stable overall, so we can recommend the grub screw solution as a means of controlling muzzle velocity. Next, let's measure efficiency. First off, in continuous semi-auto at 74 Fahrenheit, the gun was able to manage a whopping 173 continuous shots before it could no longer lock open. This seemed too good to be true, so we tested again, getting 170, and then again, getting 178. Normally, we would now measure how many shots it does with time to warm up between mags, but frankly, that seems unnecessary. This is astonishing performance for a gun with as much reciprocating mass as it does. So next is bursts of full auto, where the gun managed to chug through the same magazine three times in a row without issue. But then tapered off during the fourth. Now with the gun having such surprisingly high efficiency, we wanted to test what it would do in cold weather. So we refrigerated a magazine until it hit 48 Fahrenheit, then repeated the first continuous semi-auto test. This time it was able to do 113 shots before it ran dead. But you know what VFC, it looks like there might be something to that moving magazine router, because we can observe the gun continuing to sluggishly cycle even when the input pressure is clearly very low. The good internal seals and enormous gas capacity in the magazines, about 30 grams of propane, combine to give the FAL surprisingly good performance even in cold weather. On to accuracy testing. The stock grouping at 20 yards isn't bad, but this isn't exceptional either. We tried our usual standby of a PDIW hold and found that it surprisingly didn't group as well as stock. We also tried an MR hop. Mr. Hop? Nah, that sounds silly. And the grouping was about the same as stock, but with occasional underhop and overhop as expected. And lastly, we tried an old maple leaf diamond bucking, and surprisingly, this produced the best results of any of them. While W holds and MR hops are both fine buckings, the design of the tensioner here is both concave, which is not ideal for the W hold, and short, which is not ideal for any R hop esque bucking. Instead, it seems to favor a bucking with a tapering contact patch, so we'd suggest a maple leaf Decepticon 70 degree as an easy to find drop in improvement. Now let's talk about some of the operational characteristics of the gun. First, the big thing is that this is a battle rifle, and frankly it makes a full-length M16 look small. So while it may be workable indoors if you know how to short stock and move around cover, it is not ideal for CQB. A more subtle element that's easy to miss is the length of pull. It's about an inch longer than a fully extended M4 stock or an M16A2 stock, and this affects how the rifle is held. With a modern, squared-up stance, the bulk of the rifle's weight extends far out in front, which causes fatigue. It also causes wrist strain for many shooters due to the aggressive angle of the pistol grip. 
Adopting a more bladed stance, as the rifle was designed for, solves both problems, and since we don't need to worry about presenting the strike face of our plates to 6mm caseless, this works just fine. We also award style points for chicken wing, palm stabilization, and center of gravity alignment, though your effectiveness using those outside a marksmanship competition may vary. As well, because the weight is distributed so far out, swinging the entire gun up from the ubiquitous low ready position is awkward and cumbersome, and running like this is likely to catch the muzzle on the ground. It's considerably easier to maintain high ready, reducing the amount of rotation that needs to be made to bring the rifle to bear on target. All that said, the gun only weighs about 8 pounds loaded, which is noticeably lighter than the real thing at about 11 pounds loaded. Part of that is the use of alloy rather than steel for the receiver and barrel, and part of that is just that airsoft mags are tremendously lighter than loaded FAL mags. Now as for the magazines, while they only weigh about a pound, they are quite large. Any pouch capable of holding 308 magazines should be able to fit them, but they're going to take up a lot of real estate on your gear, and remember that the capacity is 28 apiece. But since they hold a ton of gas and are fairly easy to reload, it may be viable to simply carry a limited number of mags in a speed loader. The controls are surprisingly modern. For a tactical reload, it's fairly easy to push the mag release with the right hand index finger while bringing a new mag up. And for a speed reload, the release can be pushed with the offhand thumb, or with the index finger again. Despite the rock and lock operation, it's much easier to align properly than on something like an AK. Once a new mag is inserted, you can either pull down on the bolt release, or it may be easier to just rack the charging handle. One thing we noticed was that before modifying it, the carry handle would tend to bounce around in use, and this can potentially get in the way of the charging handle or even the sights. It's easy to tighten up as we showed earlier, or removing the carry handle is historically accurate for certain users, so either way it's an easy fix. And lastly, the sights. The rear aperture is narrow, but it visually opens up when the eye is close. This works fine in daylight, but it's a bit narrow for low light, so opening it up a bit might not be a bad idea for airsoft use. The height above the stock is about the same as an AR, so it's usable with typical mesh face pro. You can also bump up the range adjustment to raise the rear sight as needed, and then adjust the front sight to compensate. If a rail dust cover is installed though, that will block the irons, and this brings us to real steel compatibility. First off, you can safely assume that most external parts will fit with little to no modification, with one big caveat. I mentioned at the start of this review that there are two families of FAL, inch, and metric. This rifle is copied off a metric pattern, and many inch pattern parts will not fit. There's a handy thread on FAL files that lists what will and will not interchange, so we'll link it in the description. So long as you stick to metric parts, most things are a drop-in fit. Now I'm very tired of this VFC furniture by now, so let's fix it by substituting a set of real metric furniture. The handguards come off with one screw, and the real ones go on the same way. Drop in fit. Next, the pistol grip screw requires a flathead screwdriver, and then the new pistol grip also just drops right in. The stock is... well... In theory, all you need to do is unscrew the tang screw, take off the plastic pretending to be rubber recoil pad, and direct it to the nearest trash can, then use something like a valve tool or a pair of pliers to unscrew a threaded insert to the recoil tube that holds the stock in place. In practice, VFC helpfully threadlocked this insert into the recoil tube, so instead the entire tube had to come off. This was a miserable and difficult process, just like it is on the real thing, but I only had to do it once, then just threadlocked the recoil spring tube into the receiver, and used a pair of pliers to hold it steady while I extracted the insert. With that done, the new stock just needs a little bit of filing to clear the stock tang, and then it slides right on, and the plug goes in the back. Note that as far as furniture, there are a couple of different styles. Later FAL stocks ditched the iconic sloped comb for a flat profile similar to the G3. Wood stocks were also available in both patterns. For handguards, early German, Austrian, and Dutch guns used metal handguards. These are really unpleasant to hold after shooting a couple mags on the real thing, but they're perfect for airsoft. There's also an Israeli pattern with a wood grip, and if you want rails, DS Arms has a number of options. Speaking of handguards, I want to mention that this lug on the barrel and these grooves in the handguards are actually for a clamp-on bipod. 
This steel bipod was standard issue on German and Austrian FALs, and while it may not be especially useful for airsoft, it just so happens to clamp over the vulnerable point where the barrel extension threads on. So using one of these might provide insurance against the possibility of barrel breakage. For a more modern optic solution, real rail dust covers are a drop-in fit. This is a heavily used B-square mount from the 90s, but there are more modern alternatives. There's a cheap AIM Sports mount, and it looks like VFC is already making one of their own, but the DS Arms mount is both cheaper than the VFC ripoff and better built than the AIM one, so we would suggest going with that. As far as other real steel parts, the rest is cosmetic, so knock yourselves out. Or just leave the VFC parts alone, as aside from the handful of pot metal parts, the steel ones are well made and not particularly worth replacing. Besides, we know half of you are going to make a beeline for the worst green and yellow paint known to man, and once that's slopped on, it won't really matter what parts are underneath, will it? One last thing to touch on is the para conversion. No, cannot be done, at least not easily. It's more than just a stock swap. It actually uses a different grip housing and a redesigned recoil system. However, we do notice that on the bolt carrier, the spring channel for the tail looks a lot like it could house a recoil spring. We believe it would be fairly easy to convert a real para conversion kit to fit, swap in VFC springs, and then work out a suitable recoil spring substitute, but we'll be very surprised if VFC doesn't release a para variant sometime in the next year. Okay, let's wrap this up with summarized pros and cons. I'll be honest, I was initially disappointed, but the more time I spend with it, the more I like it. The gun is mostly steel construction, generally good quality of materials both externally and internally, but the use of pot metal for the barrels, an inexplicable and significant flaw, and the furniture is mediocre. It is well designed internally, with no signs of obvious weak points or need for upgrades, and it has very good real steel compatibility, with the caveat that FALs themselves don't have 100% compatibility with each other. In shooting, it's very loud, it kicks hard, has a fantastic gas capacity, and generously holds more BBs per mag than the real thing. The magazines themselves are also very well designed, and we don't anticipate issues there. And hot performance out of the box is just okay, but it's also fairly easy and cheap to fix. But yeah, how much does it cost? Right, 624 US dollars plus shipping. A new bucking might be cheap, but the gun certainly isn't. Over $600 plus shipping is a lot of money for a gun that can't honestly claim to be full steel. There is a full steel deluxe version coming, and Octagon reports that it will be $885, but we've seen other sources indicating over $1,000 plus shipping, and that's just too much. But if Bowmaster ends up making a steel barrel for it like they did for VFC's G3, then that will be a fairly cheap fix for the biggest external flaw. So, at under $700 in total for a gun, a new barrel, and a new bucking, the resulting gun will be better bang for your buck than, say, a WE M14 with RA Tech Kit, or a GHK AK with W and S steel internals. As for the mags, while they hold only 28 BBs, at $55 a piece they're pretty typically priced, and the gas capacity means you can definitely get away with fewer mags so long as you have a speed loader. Overall, while we're a bit disappointed that this isn't full steel, the price still seems fairly competitive. VFC has improved their products a lot over the last decade, and this might just be their best gun yet. There are a few things we've nitpicked, and we're really hoping for an aftermarket steel barrel, but on the whole it's solidly built, performs well, and is just tremendously fun to shoot. This is a quality gas blowback gun in its own right, so if you've been waiting for a gas FAL, we're pleased to report that you now have not only an option, but a good one. Well that's all for today, let us know in the comments if there's anything you'd like to know that we didn't cover, and as always, thanks for watching. Got him. He's hiding. There we go. Oh.